Good morning, everyone in Washington and good afternoon in Europe. My name is Julia Friedlander. I'm the C. Boyd and Gray Senior Fellow and Director of the Economic Statecraft Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. It's an interesting time for global trade. The supply chain crises have been compounded by the Russia crisis following on uh, a COVID crisis that has uh, sh sort of shattered some of our illusions about global trading systems and supply chains. But it's also a, a sense of power of opportunity. We have the, tra the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council just coming off of that meeting of the past couple of days. We have a budding relationship between ministers on both sides of the Atlantic. And as my swan song event here at the Atlantic Council before I head to Berlin next week, I wanted to take the opportunity to speak with three distinguished experts on these issues, looking at the realities on the ground, what to expect in the coming weeks, months, and perhaps years in trade, uh, and also to think rather, frankly, optimistically about transatlantic opportunities. So here with me today, we have Thomas Bert, who is the head of the trade section at the EU delegation, Beth Baltzan, who is a senior advisor to Ambassador Tai at USTR, and my very own colleague, Charles Litchfield, who's our deputy director and an expert on the Russian economy. So without further ado, please, uh, please enter any questions you have uh, digitally over Zoom, and I'll come to them here on the iPad, and I'll get to them as soon as possible. So to start off, maybe I'll first turn to you, Beth. Thank you so much, Julia. I'm honored to be included with the folks on this panel and to be part of your swan song. I know we will continue our transatlantic relationship. Um, I think the way you framed it is exactly what, what we're trying to confront, which is shattered illusions, but also opportunity. Um, and I think these supply chain crises have exposed the shortcomings of what Ambassador Tai has referred to as globalization 1.0. Uh, globalization 1.0 is really the product of a, a thinking that emerged in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where we were very focused on the opportunity to achieve something approaching a free market. And the idea was you get the government out of the way, and then you defer to business to allocate resources efficiently. Um, we were so enamored with this approach that we didn't really put any guardrails around what that efficiency might look like. We didn't think about how those efficiencies might be achieved, if it's labor arbitrage, environmental arbitrage, uh, tax arbitrage. We also didn't think about where, where those efficiencies might be achieved and whether we would see some challenges around the geopolitical uh, location of, of those supply chains. I think around the same time, we had the emergence of the Milton Friedman line of thinking, which was that the purpose of a corporation is to maximize shareholder returns. The purpose is to maximize profit. And I think when we see those two things coming together, we have some insight into how we ended up where, where we are today. Countries that are trying to attract investment understood that they needed to make themselves the low cost producer. Is that comparative advantage or is there interference? Interference with the exercise of labor rights, interference with environmental regulation. And so now we see um, the end result of that is these supply chain shocks. Uh, the, the system let our people down, right? We didn't have PPE for frontline workers. Uh, as one of the most stark examples, and now we're talking about issues around food security in 2022. Um, I think there is a lot of fealty around globalization 1.0. I've been working on these issues for close to 30 years now. I think there's almost a sense that globalization 1.0 is a manifestation of natural law and that we shouldn't tinker with it. If we tinker with it, we're tinking, tinkering with Mother Nature. It's really important to understand that we didn't always look at the economy through the lens of what we're calling efficiency. Uh, if you look at the merger debate that's going on right now, you look at some of the court cases around mergers in 50s, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we valued things like total capacity, total output, total employment. Um, and so as we see that conversation and think about it on the trade side, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation around whether we need a new Bretton Woods. Some of that conversation has happened here at the council. 
I think we ought to be clear that we never actually executed the old Bretton Woods, at least on the trade side, where it wasn't supposed to be just the GATT. The GATT was a piece of a much larger puzzle that attempted to address some of these issues. So in the ITO charter, there were enforceable labor rules, but there are also rules that were designed to try to prevent the kind of production concentration that we're seeing today and that we're now left grappling with. This was not a crowd that believed that you just got government out of the way and deferred to business judgment. The government actually had a role. So I hope, as we think about globalization 1.0 versus globalization 2.0, that we can be inspired by some of the thinking of some very wise people who tried to deliver the post-war peace for us. And so in that regard, um, I think the TTC, our relationship with the European Union, especially over the last 18 months, Julia, to your point, shattered illusions, but also opportunity. The TTC is really a chance for us to try to figure out how we want to tackle these issues going forward. I also want to acknowledge in the invitation your reference to developing economies. There are like-minded developing economies, and they absolutely should be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. And Thomas, you just you told me just as you arrived here that you were jet lagged because you just got back from Paris. So that means you're fresh off the fresh off the plane. Um, let us uh, give us a little bit of insight about the TTC and reflect a little bit on what on, on, on Beth's uh, presentation of 1.0 versus 2.0. Thank you, Julian. It's great to be here with all of you, and especially on your last day before you go to the other side, to the European side. <laughs> Wishing you all the best there. Um, yes, jet lag hangover. I don't know what I what I what I'm feeling, but I certainly Maybe feel both, en yeah. energized <laughs> after our second meeting of the Trade and Technology Council in in Paris only uh, a year ago, less than a year ago. Uh, our leaders, uh, President Biden, President uh, von der Leyen, agreed to set up a, a new a, a new platform, really, as part of a new relationship. Um, uh, where we want to get things done. We are not each other's problem. We are each other's partner, essentially. It's something I've been stressing a lot uh, in, in, the, in the four years that I've been here in Washington. And uh, essentially, we see this relationship as a platform to address global challenges. It's something we, we put out in a, in a policy paper of, of the European Commission just before, actually, the inauguration of the Biden administration. And those, those challenges have been numerous, uh, COVID, climate, China. Uh, and now we have new challenges added to that. Um, and I'm very happy to see how in less than a year, uh, with two consecutive meetings, the, the Trade and Technology Council has really become the, the prime sort of platform for, for addressing uh, those global challenges, and there's, there's many of them. Um, I was very happy to see in, in Paris, uh, as, as in Pittsburgh before, that there is a real premium for in-person uh, conversations and for uh, rekindling some of, the, some of the romance in our relationship, really, with, uh, with very strong ties with, uh, between, between our principals uh, that, that participate in the Trade and Technology Council and that essentially uh, share a, a, a lot of uh, the diagnosis. And I think Beth already set the table quite nicely in terms of that diagnosis and where we are trying to come to the remedies. What can we really do to address uh, those, uh, those global challenges? Supply chains, I think it's the front runner in the TTC. I mean, I know people are, are looking at the TTC and they're wondering what, what this is all about. Um, there are indeed 10 working groups. There's a lot of things that are being discussed. Uh, but supply chains is definitely the number one uh, issue, I would say. Um, coming out of uh, a COVID crisis, uh, we, we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we, we made mistakes also in the, in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, but we have the benefit of, 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 uh, of, of learning, of drawing those lessons. And, and we are confronted now with a new supply chain uh, challenge uh, in the shorter term, but also in the longer term, as we think about Russia and as we think also about uh, China. So semiconductors is a clear, is a clear example, uh, but we have critical raw materials as another one where we're trying to essentially work on uh, creating greater transparency. I would say it's part of the diagnosis, trying to understand where are the bottlenecks, what are the actual issues, where are, where are the chips uh, going to and where they're coming from. Um, but we're also trying to align our, our incentives. Uh, we, we both, uh, through our respective CHIPS Act that are going through decision making in Brussels and in Washington, uh, we're both looking for uh, providing incentives and an ecosystem that is supportive of, of, of uh, developing and producing the chips that we need. Um, and it's, it's very important that we, we do that in close cooperation, that we do not create uh, any sort of uh, an unfair competition, that we do not create overcapacity, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and that we really target in a, in a smart and strategic way uh, the needs that we both have and that we see in this, uh, in this sector. The third leg of that conversation, so apart from transparency and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the kind of subsidy alignment or incentive alignment, we're also looking at uh, fostering greater R&D cooperation, especially in the semiconductor area. 
The same will happen on, on critical raw materials. Of course, that's a particular challenge, and we may talk more about that in, uh, in the Russia-Ukraine uh, context. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just one example of how uh, coming together around global challenges with a shared diagnosis, but also uh, coordinated remedies is uh, critically important. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential in uh, the Trade and Technology Council. Maybe two quick points to add. Um, I know people are, 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 are anxious to see the results of the Trade and Technology Council, and we are seeing uh, results already. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind that we, we put in place a process, and I think Pittsburgh was quite critical uh, in doing that. Paris was about the policy setting, and now we're really moving to, let's say, the project stage, the stage where we're going to see more deliverables, more concrete action and cooperation. And my second point is that we obviously hope to work with stakeholders, uh, think tanks, businesses, and others, uh, to really help us get, this, get, get to the finish line and identify those core priorities. Um, so there will be a lot more work on, on stakeholder dialogue, um, a stakeholder, a stakeholder outreach. So I'm, I'm counting on a, on a good uh, discussion moving forward on the Trade and Technology Council. Thank you. And as a former technocrat myself, I like processes, I like formats, um, and uh, immediate results aren't necessarily the, the goal in and of itself, right? I mean, for me, a lot of this is more a reflection of um, preventing further, uh, further barriers from coming into place versus taking away ones that already exist, right? It's a forward, forward leaning thing. Um, but Charles, so the TTC is maybe like a test case for, you know, for handling a crisis like the one that we've been analyzing at the council. And Charles came to us really at the right time as our new deputy, um, as, a, as a, someone who had written a master's thesis on the Russian Central Bank. So uh, we're very grateful to have his expertise. But if you look at, um, at many of the tools the West has used, right, right, and this, and again, many of them have been discussed in this transatlantic context. Um, have to do with supply chains, have to do with uh, limitations on commercial activity. What does this say to you about you know, our response, uh, Western economies, and also, of course, about Russia? Um, well, we've seen tremendous uh, coordination over the Russia crisis, and I think the TTC is, is separate to that. The TTC is another forum. It was there before the Russia crisis. It will hopefully uh, outlive uh, the Russia crisis. Sure. <laughs> um, but it did uh, come at the right time uh, in terms of getting us around a table again, having a posit more positive conversation rather than a negative one. Uh, so I think the two are somewhat interlinked. Uh, but I think it was, it was reassuring to see that at the meeting in Seclet, um, most participants were very clear that the focus of the TTC hasn't changed. It's not just about Russia because there's a Russia crisis. That informs perhaps uh, the fact that we have so much in common uh, and that we have um, some weaknesses that we can work on together and perhaps improve on them. Uh, but the focus of, of uh, the TTC is much more China than it is Russia and will remain so. Um, I was also interested to see that uh, Commissioner Vestager at the beginning of her, uh, rather the end of her speech, she started with some theoretical ideas about the TTC and then she sort of shrugged and said, well, basically today we're going to talk about chips and uh, uh, raw materials. Um, and when you look in the Russia context, um, it doesn't really, it, the, the relationship with Russia isn't the same as China just through those two windows. Uh, on chips, uh, it, it is us, the West, who are not, no longer selling chips to Russia, uh, whereas we were before somewhat and that's been blocked. Um, whereas on China, we, we depend on China, we depend on that part of the world for them to sell us uh, that kind of technology. And on raw materials, it is um, us who are more dependent on Russia, although um, we are seeing that we're being very innovative in coming up with um, other ways to um, seek new sources of supply. Um, so that momentum that we have from the TTC in the better mood, I think, has been very positive. Um, but we shouldn't um, sort of try to overburden the TTC with uh, this Russia crisis. There are other fora for talking about it. The sanctions fora has uh, been very successful, and it was coordinated at a very high level, didn't require the TTC. Um, and the TTC is really about, as you were saying, Beth, um, sort of coming to a realization that our uh, globalization 1.0 has run out of road and that we need a new approach. Um, and I think the TTC can do a very good job at that. Um, it's no longer about sort of imagining running after the next point of growth, the one that's missing, what, what TTIP was about. And uh, people always make the mistake of comparing TTIP to TTC. They're very different, and I'm not suggesting they're the same. But this is how, how far we've come. It's the improvement we've made. It's no longer about sort of running after that point of that elusive point of growth that we could have uh, thanks to uh, Ricardo theory and improving our trade relations. Uh, it's much more about preventing uh, new barriers from coming up due to the rapid innovation that's happening. And I think the TTC um, is well, heartening to all of us in that the mood has improved and also it's very relevant because it can be a forum for all of these discussions. And um, I was quite amused to hear in a recent discussion we had with both US and EU officials uh, about what to expect from Seculate. Now it's happened and we can look at some of the results. Uh, but he, he described the TTC as a, a safe space, a place where um, 
we could uh, observe each other, we could look at where the um, overlap was, where the limitations were, and it wasn't an explosive environment. It's a place where these conversations can take place, and it's a positive conversation, so that's reassuring. Um, I have plenty of questions here, but I've, I've opportunities to respond to each other. Yeah, I just have a quick, a quick point maybe, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the bureaucrat in the room here, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I do want to say that we talk about processes and policies, but at the end of the day, there's people behind there. Yeah. And what is very important and what you see in Paris is that you, you, you get chemistry between people and, and relationships move at the speed of trust. And, and so it's so critical to get people together in a room uh, outside of Washington, outside of Brussels. Uh, so going to Pittsburgh, going to Saclay was, was extremely useful and has really helped us to, to deal with the challenges that came in relation to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. I mean, some people think that you, it, it may take a, a quick phone call the night before to announce a big package of sanctions. Well, it, it obviously does not. It, it takes uh, lots of preparation, and I, I, I know you know that from, from your previous time uh, at the Treasury and, and, and the NSC. Um, so I think the TTC was really helpful, even if it was not the explicit goal, it was really helpful to have those links, to have those relationships and that trust to come together around the export control questions in a, in a record time, really, and, and with, a, with an unprecedented outcome. So I really want us to, to think beyond the processes, beyond the policies, but really look at this as a place where people come together. And I agree with you, Charles, and, and, and that, that we, we obviously have the policy discussion there, the diagnosis, and that becomes a platform for dealing with the remedies and, and the questions of how are we going to deal with those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can only underscore that. And I, you know, just from my own experience, I have never seen better transatlantic coordination. You know, I was, I was a, in the government for 10 years, and I was the transatlantic point person. And uh, there were always frictions, right? Even, even, even if the government's gone along well, right? And even, you know, in the Obama times, you know. So I think that this is really a testament um, both to, to diplomacy, to, the, to dedication, but also to the, to the, uh, to the issues at hand, right? It's, it's not a, it's not a it's not a, a transatlantic relationship that it's a nice to have. It's a necessary one, right? And and and, the, and events have shown that. Um, Beth, maybe I can come back to you first and ask, what does uh, globalization 2.0 look like? I mean, again, because we have you know Sec Secretary Yellen was here a few weeks ago, talked about pluralateralism. Um, we've heard um, talk about like mo of of you know friend shoring, um, but Ambassador Tai talks about globalization 2.0. So right. what does that mean? So uh, we recently had the 15th anniversary of the May 10th Agreement. For folks who don't know what that is, that was in 2007. There were four pending trade agreements in the United States. There was uh, an agreement between the Bush administration and Congress to have enforceable labor and environmental provisions in our trade agreements. There were also uh, some provisions around access to medicines in developing countries. And I think that is maybe the foundation of how we think about globalization 2.0, that there actually are guardrails we can put in these types of agreements, um, that we can think about how globalization is serving individuals. The ambassador talks very frequently about the human component of trade and being more responsive to the human component of trade. And so I think you, we're, we're one of the great things about Ambassador Tai, she doesn't have a whole set of rules that she's looking to impose on everyone else. She wants this to be crowdsourced. She wants this to be an incubation opportunity for us to learn from each other and come together and figure out really what it should what it should look like. And one thing I want to say that I think is particularly valuable about the TTC, and this gets to sort of your remarks, um, that we're trying to solve pretty specific problems. And I think that is a real step forward. This isn't about we have our cookie cutter approach to agreements, and you have your different cookie cutter approach to agreements, and then we fight over who, whose cookie cutter wins. This is really focusing on specific challenges and trying to figure out how we're going to solve them. Mm -hmm. And what, How does that sound to you? Well, I, I think we share a lot of the, the analysis. Again, um, I, I go back to my own days in, in Brussels in 2015. We, we designed a trade uh, strategy, which was called Trade for All, the idea that trade needs to deliver on, uh, on a lot of promises, and for a lot of people, actually, including those that feel left behind. I, I always kind of said, uh, well, the subtitles should really be Trade Cannot Do It All, um, because we are overloading the boat. And, and I, I agree with that, that there are a number of things. People just don't care about what's in the container, but also how, how those things are being produced. I mean, is it done in respect of um, labor standards and environmental criteria, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think we both uh, share that interest. We talk a lot about values. I think that's the, the, the essence underpinning also the work of the Trade and Technology Council. Uh, but I also think we need to be realistic here. Um, and, and I think we need to also keep in mind our North Star. And for, for, for us in Europe, um, I mean, I know there's a general reluctance in Washington, as there is perhaps in Brussels, to use the F word. 
free trade. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we, we still think about trade in terms of open and rules-based trade and, and to fundamentally deliver on uh, the predictability that is needed, the clarity that is needed for our businesses and, and other stakeholders uh, to, uh, to, 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 work, uh, to work in. So, so that, I think, is something where uh, we, we're trying to be focused. We're trying to make sure that we, we deliver on that key promise while taking into account, into account the wider societal expectations of trade policy. So trade for all, but trade cannot do it all. I think that would be part of my response. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like different economies of scale, right? Not price maximization, but different, yeah. Um, we can maybe, I don't know, I say that because I think about reading the, the models in my economics textbooks and seeing how, you know, what I was, was inoculated with, right, yes. in my trade, my trade policy classes and how maybe those textbooks will look different when you've written them. Um, but, uh, but Charles, when, when you hear our, our, our dear officials say this, when you think about the crises that you're looking at right now, do you think the toolbox is there, right? Um. I think, I think we're getting there, and I'm very curious to hear what TTC produces ultimately as a toolbox. Um, it seems that Pittsburgh went quite well, Paris went extremely well, uh, and we're now into the sort of actual nitty gritty of the working committees and what we actually do. I'm quite intrigued by uh, the strategic standardization information mechanism. What does it look like? Um, how and which stakeholders can um, sort of make a notification, and where does that go? What, does it, what happens? Um, I'm curious, really, because uh, that's exactly um, how this is supposed to be, have a sort of quicker cycle where people notice that a divergence is happening or there's a potential for us to converge. Um, so uh, I might ask the other panelists exactly how that's going to work. Um, because I think um, while we have the positive momentum there, there is much more that could happen in terms of um, rapid response mechanisms when we see a divergence happening, when we suddenly notice that there's some sort of uh, supply chain bottleneck that needs to be dealt with. Um, so I, I don't think we're quite there, and I'm intrigued to hear what, what you think will happen next. Sure, go ha ahead. Happy, happy to sort of bring the Paris perspective, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not speaking, I'm not trying to speak for you here, but um, thanks, Charles, for raising that. I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the very concrete outcomes we saw in Paris where we, we, had, uh, we saw the signature of the SSI, which is the new jargon, uh, this uh, strategic standardization instrument mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the idea is very simple, and it's, it's a core idea that, is, that underpins the entire work of the TTC, the idea that we really need to come together um, to, to set standards, to set rules, uh, not necessarily in the same way, but where we cooperate and where we take into account each other's perspective. Um, and so as part of working group one, one of, one of the 10 working groups, the one that deals with technology standardization questions, we have basically set uh, or put in place an arrangement where we create contact points and where stakeholders and also regulators, of course, can mm -hmm. come forward and identify issues as they, as they happen. And we try to focus on what my director general has now called in the last two days virgin areas. I'm not sure I should use the same, uh, the same jargon necessarily. But the idea is very simple. It's the, it's the idea that we are not going to spend all our time on differences that are, that are, that are outstanding, that are longstanding differences, uh, where, where we each have developed our ways and our preferences, and we, we don't like GMOs, and we, we are keen on privacy, whatever. Um, but where we're saying, well, we haven't really figured this out yet, um, or we're starting to figure this out. And can we, before we each go our ways, can we, can we at least check in with each other? And can we agree on the fundamental objectives that we're pursuing here? Which doesn't mean we have, we have to come up with the same responses, the exact same uh, uh, policies uh, to, to, to deal with those uh, challenges, uh, but where we at least check in with each other and have that kind of early warning mechanism. So the SSI is essentially that. It's part of the diagnostics in our toolbox um, to, to deal with uh, uh, these questions. Now, as we speak about toolboxes, maybe just one thing that I want to add, and, and we definitely need some retooling here. I think we need to think about tools. Um, as a European, I'm sometimes accused of thinking too much about rules, and Americans think too much about tools. Um, I think there's <laughs> some, some yeah. tension here, and maybe <laughs> this goes back to my preference for open rules-based trade and, 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 and sort of uh, uh, rules in a, in, a, in a global governance context. Um, but I think we need to think about our toolbox. Um, and and I, I often think about Maslow's hammer, for example, and mm. the, the idea that if, if you hold a hammer, all your problems look like nails. I think this is an issue we've had a little bit in trade policy with the the FDA instrument as our sort of dominant strength and, and the fact that we, we hammer away uh, every sort of challenge gets an FDA as a response. And, and maybe there's, that there's an interesting discussion there to be had because we still believe in FDAs. Uh, we still uh, want to expand our, 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 our network of more than 74 uh, FDAs right now. I don't think, I may say that it's a 20th century uh, <laughs> or a sort of tool, uh, but I think the other point is we, we do need to think about other tools. And I think that's what the TTC is trying to do. Um, for a trade um, person, it's of course a very uh, interesting situation because we're not just looking at welfare creation. We are effectively weaponizing our, our, our links, our supply chains, our, our, our trade. 
Um, and we are doing welfare destruction in some cases, and, yes. and, and deliberately so in relation to Russia. Whereas with China, we have other questions to think about. It may also involve a certain degree of welfare destruction. So I think we definitely need to think about the blue box. And again, we're going to innovate. Uh, we have a platform for it. Uh, that's where I expect a lot from, uh, from, from the TTC. But it does all start in some way with diagnostics and, and the early warning mechanism that we have now with the, uh, the SSI, the Strategic Standardization Instrument. I think it's part of the diagnostics that we need. Uh, and, and we will, I mean, we could talk about I mean, the use of the DPA, the, the Defense Production Act, for example, here. Uh, again, interesting announcement yesterday as, as, we, as we all look at the, 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 the crisis situation on baby formula. Um, and we, we will have in Europe our own discussions on that. I think we are, uh, we are looking at our own toolbox very much. Uh, I, I always love the idea that a good trade policy starts at home. The idea that what we're ultimately doing is leverage mm -hmm. our, our internal market, our product. So we're doing a lot of work on our domestic toolbox, on sharpening the saw uh, as we think about uh, uh, trade. So, so definitely an interesting discussion to be had on, on tools, and, and I would add also on rules. Yeah, no, I think about that because I, you know, I mean, I was um, in, at the NSC during the during the Trump administration, and there were there were a lot of nails found, right? Um, uh, and using tools that hadn't been thought of in a very very long time, and that's why. So it always comes to me and say, okay, well, what's the balance here between uh, restrictive measures that are placed on others versus the um, the gro growth incentives at home, right? And, and I really don't, you know, I don't think we've found that balance yet. Right, because we don't really know what um, how our domestic economies are going to react. Um, maybe I can ask, but just because I, you know I'm a former intelligence analyst, so I have to look at negatives. <laughs> um, I mean, what what is what are the downsides of welfare destruction, right, on over a longer term? If you use it, I mean, again, if you create plur plurilateral agreements, you are closing off markets, you are closing off growth opportunities. Um, so maybe I could ask all of you, sort of, what are, what are the potential risks here that we're we're not looking at, and how are developing economies going to react to that? Because for many of many of these economies are first, you know, coming to appreciate the system that we've appreciated for a while. Maybe Beth, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, you know, it is it is a challenge if we're going to orient ourselves away from the philosophy we had about how the marketplace operates that sort of set the table for globalization 1.0. I think the imperative is for us now to look at all of these issues much more strategically. So it's less about advancing sort of general philosophy and an ideology and much more looking at, uh, at, at these issues um, in this problem solving frame of mind. Um, and that's something that we haven't really used in the past. And so are there opportunities? Yes. I think for, for Europe and the United States, you can see it in the TTC document, we are very much focused on making sure democracies can survive this kind of upheaval. That's not true for everyone. And so we've got to think about how democracy fits into this whole narrative, this whole discussion about how we approach markets and the degree to which, to some extent, if you have significant investments in a geopolitically fraught area, what does that do to your ability to actually defend yourself, to protect yourself, to protect your democracy? I mean, we're seeing that right now with the food crisis, right? Uh, Charles, you were raising your eyebrow. Oh, I'm, I, the, que the question made me think of some of the um, risks this uh, process entails. Um, let's imagine the early warning system is used in a profligate way and suddenly we have uh, working groups and um, reshoring of production and all sorts of things um, when there is a short-term problem but ultimately it, it undermines um, the philosophy that we claim to still have that is pro-free trade and pro-engaging um, with all countries that want to um, do trade with us. You mentioned PPE. Um, it is obviously, it was a huge problem that we didn't have the production capacity right at the beginning and it makes sense that we have repatriated some of that. Um, but does it, what happens to these factories now? Do they go back to producing what they were, what they were doing before? Or do we continuously have this PPE production capacity, which hopefully for the next 50 years we, we won't be needing? Um, so I think we do need to be mindful of the risks of um, repatriating too much production of um, a, a profligate use of the early warning system, a profligate use of French shoring. Um, but I mean, it does seem that we're trying to use this in a, a sort of scalpel, precise way. We're not. We're not that I'm reassured by hearing that we're looking at very, very pinpointed technical issues, but it is a risk we have to have in mind that we could undermine our general philosophy by uh, repatriating too many things. 
I, I would pick up on both, uh, both of you, and I'll start with that and agree that strategic is the key word here. And in, in Europe, we, we speak of strategic autonomy and open strategic autonomy in particular. And, and the whole idea is that we need to be smart and strategic about these questions. And these challenges, Charles is right, it's about risks. And, and in the same way, when I was listening to your question, I'm thinking about the, the risks rather that come from unwanted dependencies, the fact that we rely too much on, on certain suppliers and, and that our security of supply is actually threatened by those dependencies. So we need to navigate the risks uh, that we see in, in, these, uh, in, these, in these global challenges. Um, and, uh, and for us, clearly, I mean, diversification is still very important. The openness is very important. And there will be a degree of domestication of supply chains. And, and there will be, if you want to call it reshoring, friendshoring, but other forms of, 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 of restructuring uh, those, those supply chain. So the, the balancing act will be very important and it will very much depend on, on a risk assessment that I think both of us have done autonomously uh, through our respective exercises on, uh, on supply chains. And both of us are also doing in the context of, of, the, um, of, the, uh, of the TTC again. Uh, so absolutely, there's, there's a lot of risks, there's a lot of potential there. I think there's a lot of lessons that we can, we can learn also from, from the um, from, from COVID, and I've looked very closely at the situation with emergence biosolutions here in Baltimore. Uh, the fact that we, 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 I mean, this was a lesson coming out of the anthrax threat, and then we, we clearly had some issues here, and I'm, I'm just observing that as a, as a, as, as a guest in this country. But um, uh, so, I, and, and there's plenty of examples uh, similarly in, in Europe. So we need to be strategic, we need to be smart, and, and we certainly need to do it together. I wonder if I could just jump in, if that's okay, mm -hmm. on the question of free trade agreements and what role they have in free trade agreements as a 20th century instrument. Um, sort of the, the, the path for free trade agreements, as we have generally known them, was set during this era of globalization 1.0, where the focus was on liberalization to achieve that sort of as close as we could get uh, to, to uh, a free market. Um, and I think that the way we've structured them merits a real evaluation based on contemporary challenges that we're facing. And I will say as somebody, you know, we're talking about supply chains, we don't really talk about what the incentives are in the supply chain rules in those agreements. And that in many instances on the industrial side, those rules are, aren't really designed to promote economic integration. They're designed to preserve existing supply chains. So if we are talking about making some changes around supply chains so that they're diversified, and this isn't all repatriation, right? You want to have a core amount of capacity that you can deploy as you need. For example, the United Auto Workers making ventilators. Um, then we really need to be mindful about what those agreements were designed to achieve under globalization 1.0 and how we might want them to work if we're moving towards globalization 2.0. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, but uh, you know, how does the private sector responding to all of this, right? I mean, the, the, the nice thing about the TTC is it has stakeholder engagement. The private sector is around the table. But I think I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm a think tanker, but I think you know, when um, this sets off a lot of alarm bells, I think, for, um, for very you know, profitable US and European firms who are saying, what do I do now, and how do I, you know, do I wait for um, for the government to to regulate to figure out what globalization 2.0 looks like? Um, each form of this and what Europe does and, and what the U.S. does will look slightly different. How do I prepare for this? Um, so, I mean, I don't know, but Thomas, maybe I can. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question, and it, it it goes back to something that I've heard consistently on any issue that I worked yeah. on, including on on Brexit or, mm -hmm. or on on on. on some trade wars of the past. Um, it's the idea that businesses do well with complexity, but do very struggle very much with uncertainty. And so we really need to address this kind of uncertainty question. Complexity is something that is perhaps easier to navigate uh, for, 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 for businesses. Um, uh, so, so yes, we need to provide that certainty for us. A lot of that has to do with, uh, again, a rules-based order where we, where we try to uh, consolidate some of the so the main principles uh, uh, and, and some of the rules of the game, so that we do, that we don't have the law of the jungle essentially, um, mm -hmm. which is what you which which is what creates so much uh, uncertainty uh, that might is not right, uh, and, and that applies to trade as well as, as to the, the whole security uh, uh, discussion. So I think we we're trying to uh, we're trying to do that uh, at home where where all things start. We're trying to do that in Europe with a trend transformation, becoming green as an economy becoming more digital um, as an economy, designing the guardrails of a digital economy. This is a, a great example of how uh, a, a sector is, is developing, innovation is, is flourishing, um, but we also need to think about the guardrails uh, that we need for a fair and functioning uh, digital economy, which is why I think Europe has, uh, the European Union has, has shown leadership in, in, mm -hmm. um, 
in, in, in regulating in this area. I know not everybody is a fan of what we're doing here, and I, I tend to say sometimes here in Washington that we, we don't always get it right, but we do get it, the, the fact that something needs to be done in this area, and I think we learn. I was very worried when I came here on the back of the implementation of the GDPR, um, but now I find myself uh, almost uh, surrounded by fans of, of privacy, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be the same as we roll out our Digital Services Act, our Digital Markets Act, and there's still a few more things in the pipeline on data and on artificial intelligence. So I think uh, it starts at home, it starts um, with, with some of the domestic measures that we need to take, but we need to take them also in close cooperation. And I keep coming back to the same mm -hmm. point, the TTC is a great place to, uh, to actually um, put, put people in a room and, and knock heads together and come up with some of the, the shared interests that we have, the shared values that we have in this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me say, I think there are some folks in the business community who absolutely understand this issue, right? Larry Fink had a letter that said, you know, the way we've been doing things for the last 25 years doesn't seem to be working anymore. You have the business roundtable that really challenged what the purpose of a corporation is. Is it only about profit maximization? You have the investor community saying, we need, we need some metrics for ESG. We want to know what we're investing in and what the consequences are of those investments and then for business itself business doesn't need us to tell them this isn't working right i mean the supply chain bottlenecks are a real problem for businesses that can't get inputs so i think in a sense there's a convergence around understanding that something needs to change and that we can figure out together how to change it mm -hmm. Josh? um perhaps i slightly disagree just for the sake of argument with beth um i don't really disagree fundamentally but um I think those businesses will always want to ma maximize profit, and that's what they're there for, so that's their purpose. Um, but they also want to be regulated. So that's how my, my experience of, uh, in my previous existence as a consultant, um, I always found the businesses were seeking ways to maximize profit, that's what they do. Um, but they also would complain when uh, their new area, often they were, if, they, if they were in tech or sort of a, a more innovative field, um, that they got blamed for doing things that weren't against the law. Uh, but that you know, were perhaps ethically a bit iffy, and therefore they, they had this desire to be regulated so that there was an even playing field, there were rules. But then within those rules, they, they will tr try to maximize profit. I think that's pretty clear. So it's about engaging with them on uh, what the rules should be. Um, obviously, listening to stakeholders, I think it's, all, it's pretty clear that we're, we're, um, we're in a stage where we're listening. Um, but I think profit maximization will always remain the goal. Can I come back to that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a great point. And I think, I, you know, I'm not sure these supply chain bottlenecks are really good for profit maximization. Mm. So there's some examination there. But also, I think one of the key issues is short term versus long term. And when you look at some of the business leaders who are trying to tackle this issue, particularly in the ESG space, they're saying, if you look at the long term profit maximization, then we need to be thinking about these issues, right? Versus this short-term quarterly returns reporting requirement that puts pressure on them to cut everything as close to the bone as possible and doesn't let them take the longer-term approach that I think some of these companies really want to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to start taking some questions from the audience, which coincidentally uh, reflects some of my own continuing questions. What, what, uh, what are like-minded economies outside of the transatlantic orbit doing with this, right? South Korea, Japan, um, others in the you know, British Commonwealth, former British Commonwealth, for example. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that they feel like, you know, we want, we want to tack on. Is it become compatible um, when you are looking at, again, a, a ge geographic diversity there for some of these issues? Well, I, I can start and, and, and say that in Paris, I heard uh, one of our, our ministers use the word uh, TTC spin-off. I mean, the mm -hmm. idea is that, of course, we're, we're very happy together in a room, mm -hmm. but. There's a lot of people out there and uh, outside that, that we think we want to be bring into the conversation at some point. And, and we haven't really been uh, too specific yet of how that will be done. But the fact that it, that it has to be done is, is, is quite uh, clearly established. So I think we will be looking for conversations with especially Canada, Australia on, um, on matters of supply chain security, for example, including uh, on, on the question of critical raw materials uh, in, in particular. But also others. I, I don't think it's, it's just a question of, 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 of clubbing together as Western uh, democracies. There's a lot of a whole world out there to, uh, to, to work with. Um, and I think it's a critical part of, of that. When I go around town, I, I, I see a lot of interest in the TTC. But I also see that um, our, our trading partners are also establishing similar conversations. And I, I think we're all going to watch uh, the president's trip to, uh, to, to Asia next week together with Secretary Raimondo. Uh, where we assume uh, there will be further announcements. Uh, I can't speak to that, but um, maybe we'll see an, an Indo-Pacific economic framework where some of that same discussion will take place. And we're not jealous. I mean, I think it's great. <laughs> we're, we're having that discussion ourselves. 
we had our, our India uh, FTA negotiation that got relaunched. Uh, we're also uh, engaged in a, in a trade and tech conversation with them as we are with others. So I think it's, uh, uh, again, I come back to my instinct as a European multilateralist. At, at the end of the day, we all need to be together in, in the same room. And, uh, and I think it's a question of, of, of getting there uh, in, in sort of concentric circles uh, and with variable geometry. It's something we know as Europeans through our own process of integration, perhaps. But we'll definitely want to break out of the room and, uh, and, and, and see others, engage others, uh, not just stakeholders, but also th uh, third countries. It's an important point you make there about you know, European decision making. You guys are used to compromises, right, <laughs> within, the, within the block. Maybe less of an American thing. Um, but I mean, does, it, does this look like concentric circles, like overlapping concentric circles of plurilateralism? I mean, I, I, I imagine this world where everyone's running around the world talking to everybody else, right? And that, and that somehow, in the end, there's a lot of talk, but, we, but, but the, pe the puzzle pieces don't fit together. That's my, that's my concern a little bit. Um, but, you know, but, uh, but you said the word, the word acronym IPEF has been raised um, here uh, and also by several in the chat. So uh, I'm going to have to turn to you, Beth, and sort of <laughs> give us a little bit of a, a preview to the, to the extent that you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so echo your remarks that there isn't sort of a limited amount of thinking or cooperation that can go on. These are real challenges, and I meant what I said. We want to see ideas from everyone on how we actually fi fix these problems. What I think is really interesting, and folks will have seen the, the Federal Register notices that went out on IPAF, so it's a signal of the kinds of things that we're looking at. Some overlap with the TTC, but not, again, a cookie cutter. It's not one way of figuring out how to solve these problems and then that's the way and we pound at home. This isn't the hammer. Um, we have to be really thoughtful about this. We have to be strategic about this. And I just want to flag sort of how other countries are looking at this. Um, I think the Japanese government has been very clear. I think they've said we need to move off of neoliberalism. So that's a really interesting statement from, from, from the Japanese. And thinking more, that feeds right into what globalization 2.0 looks like. They have spent a lot of money trying to diversify their supply chains as well. But I want to point out something that the Malaysian government said, which is they're interested, and this was public, we're interested in looking at the link between ESG and supply chains. So when we have a developing economy that is saying we need to look at that, that, to me, is a real signal of where we can go. Mm -hmm. And Charles, what is this city? Well, I'm, again, I'm going to disagree this time with Thomas for the sake of argument. <laughs> He's the only one who's allowed good, to say whatever good he discussion wants. discussion so far. <laughs> but um, on this um, notion of the TTC spin-off, uh, which would be exciting, um, something uh, I've noticed, the two countries we've m which were mentioned, Japan and South Korea, did participate in the sanctions and are um, aligned with us on what's happened in Russia and have, I think, similar um, concerns about China, perhaps uh, in an even more elevated fashion, given where they are. Um, but one thing we've seen in the past three months um, that is perhaps concerning for us as Europeans and Americans is that um, it has been the West's confrontation with Russia, and uh, not that many other countries have joined us. Uh, the BRICS haven't aligned with us. Uh, they haven't condemned Russia's invasion. Um, but then in many other fora, we have developed the habit of saying they're like-minded. We often say that India is like-minded. We even have said, not recently, that, but um, we have said in the past that Brazil is like-minded. Um, and, and these conversations should be taking place with these countries as well. Uh, but the past crisis, the recent crisis, has revealed actually that we aren't that like-minded. Um, so how do we square this circle? Um, uh, how can, a, can you imagine a TTC spin-off when uh, we now know that these countries are slightly opportunistic, um, more, more so than we are, that have, they haven't been sort of spurred into action by the recent crisis. Um, so the TTC spin-off, I can see it working for the likes of Japan and South Korea, but the list is quite short, actually. Um, could also mention the UK. Um, UK is like-minded, of course. Uh, unfortunately, its relations with the EU uh, still need improvement, um, but I think it would like to take part in a conversation like this. I'd be quite confident about that. So you have the UK, you have Japan, you have South Korea, and then the list runs out pretty quickly. Um, so how do we re-engage with um, countries we had developed a habit of calling like-minded, but now we, we have doubts about that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, 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 I hope that the world is united in, in obviously, in, in, uh, in, 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 in sort of judging that the horrors that we're seeing in Ukraine by a, a a premeditated, unprovoked attack are just uh, utterly shocking, and, and I, I do see uh, widespread support for for our actions and for the positions that we've taken in in, in relation to the to the aggression by by Vladimir Putin. 
Um, so I think that that's, that's an important point to make. But you're quite right. Other, other than that, I mean, it's, it's of course, uh, uh, extremely important that we engage, that we engage with others. And as, as I said, variable geometry will mean that we'll be different conversations with different people. Um, I, I would still add Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand to, to, to your list. But, but I, I just wanted to say from the outset that it's important not just to limit uh, ourselves to those people or those countries we might uh, have a, a sort of more uh, the closer relationship with or, or uh, a different level of conversation. I think it's important that we think about Africa, that we think about those countries that are part of critical supply chains, including for raw materials, and that we engage them uh, on, these, on, these, uh, on these critical challenges. So I'm not really disagreeing there. Um, and I'm certainly seeing that the challenge, as you say, uh, that there are different conversations to, to be had. Um, but I think it's something we're, uh, we're certainly looking, uh, looking to do. And uh, we're not coming with a template, uh, or certainly not a trade template in this case. I think that's where. Um, our, our collective thinking um, and our engagement throughout the world will help us to come up with, with better responses. And they may be different responses in some cases. But do you think that the, you know, that emerging economies or developing economies share, uh, share this view on globalization and on supply chains? I mean, I think that, you know, to me, it, it, it looks a little bit like, um, uh, you know, the U.S. and Europe are re retreating a little bit from the world. Um, and the uh, per perhaps the pillars uh, under IPEF are things that they would like to aspire to, but really what they need is market access. They need something that's going to provide uh, provide quicker growth opportunities. And if and if we don't do it, someone else will provide it for them. We know who that might be, right? And so, do, is this? I mean, how, how, I mean, this has to be part of the calculation. But um, you know, how how would you respond to my uh, slight? Well, that. first of all, I would strongly disagree that we're retreating from the world, speaking for, for the European Union here. I think we, we are seeing a more interconnected world that requires mm -hmm. us to, to manage those interconnections. And, and uh, it's pretty clear that uh, connectivity causes conflict. There's a great book out there now uh, with, with that same title. Um, so I think we need to be very mindful of how we manage our, our, our connectivity. Uh, we're certainly not retreating. We're trying to be smart and strategic, as we said mm -hmm. earlier, um, in, in, including on how we want to uh, undo ourselves of unwanted dependencies, including in certain uh, critical, uh, critical areas. Um, but I think other than that, we, we, need to, we need to engage. We really need to fundamentally engage uh, countries around core values, around core ideas. Um, and that, that, that is where I think our trade policy comes in as a vehicle for, uh, for, for that, type of, uh, that type of interaction and engagement. But I'm certainly not disagreeing that it's, that it's going to be an easy, yeah. an easy <laughs> conversation. I think it's, it yeah. is quite, a, quite, a, quite an interesting conversation that we'll have. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, who suffers from the race to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Workers in the United States, we've talked about that, and we've talked about offshoring mm -hmm. due to unfair competition. Um, but workers in developing economies and the kinds of working conditions that they experience, and it, we've seen a situation where governments feel pressured to suppress labor rights and environmental rights in order to attract investment. That's just not a good dynamic. It's not a good dynamic for them. And I think developing economies, we see this so often through a north-south chain, there's a north-south frame. There's also a capital labor frame that we, we can think about where there is alignment with our goals and the goals of some of the developing economies. I also think if we're talking about supply chain diversification, which is part of this exercise, if we want a resilient economy, they stand to benefit. They stand to be the beneficiaries of supply chain diversification. I do want to sort of come back to this market access point mm -hmm. because I think this is where all the muscle memory takes us. You know, the U.S. bound rate is 3.2 percent yeah. the WTO. We already have very low tariffs. And I know when people say they want U.S. leadership, often that means they just want a little bit more market access. Um, that hasn't solved this problem to date. So we really have to be thoughtful. And again, if the supply chain rules that we use don't promote diversification of sourcing, what are we really doing for these countries? So uh, I am, uh, I am a rule of origin aficionado. It's a really important part <laughs> of the conversation <laughs> if we really want to be serious about solving real problems. Mm -hmm. Well, let me follow up because we have a, a question here again about, about food security. So, what, so how, does, how does that work in practice, right? What, is, what happens right now? Right. This we have the crisis. We have the test case for, um, for uh, issues that could affect the developing world. I mean, again, Charles and I were in, in London just a few weeks ago, and on the, on the the you know in the window of a Tesco, it said conserve your oil. Right. And this is in the UK. Right. So it it affects everyone. But again, this is the live crisis. So uh, what what do we do? What are we doing now? 
Well, a huge issue, and, and again, came up in the, in the Trade and Technology yeah. Council as, as one of the issues that we need to look at in, in the wake of the, the, the crisis and, and, and do that not just in the bilateral context, but also with a clear, a clear view on, uh, some, on, on the global picture. Again, we need to focus on what, what is the issue here, what is the diagnosis that we need to uh, exercise. We've, we've rolled out uh, already a communication on food security as, as part of the European Commission, where we're trying to offer more tools. Uh, expanding the, the use of arable land, providing more resources and incentives uh, for, for, for production, uh, but to really, and I think we, we're very much aligned, or at least from a European perspective, very much focused on addressing the impact this will have on developing and the least developed countries uh, in particular. I think our analysis is that we do not have, uh, as, as Europe, a major food security uh, question that will affect us directly, so I think this is very much a global question that we need to look at. And we're, work, we're working very much domestically as well as in cooperation uh, with the U.S. and other partners on developing uh, a policy response on food security. Um, I, I need to check whether the, 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 G8, the G7 uh, agriculture ministers have already met in Stuttgart. Uh, Secretary Vilsack mm -hmm. was going to Poland. I think we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're really having that discussion at the highest level right now. Mm -hmm. So, but again, what's the tool to consolve it? I mean, again, this is, the, this is I mean, a lot of, we have a lot of discussions. We have, you know, a lot of people moving around the world saying this is a big problem. But what, what do we actually do in the here and now to alleviate that crisis? We know what happens. We know what we do in oil markets, right? We try to um, up production, release strategic reserves, put price caps or whatever, right? To alleviate, but what, what do we do in this, for this? I mean, Beth, can you give us a creative idea? Um, <clears throat> I can only say that I think it was Nobel laureate Sen who said whenever we have challenges, or, it's not a lack of food, it's the distribution that yeah, works. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've really got to think about what we've done. It comes back to supply chains, really, uh, so that we make sure we are not running these systems so close to the bone that we don't have the flexibilities to respond in these kinds of crises. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe one, one thing to add, uh, what is very clear is that what we should not do, and to, to, to Beth's point, uh, we do not want to see export restrictions as, as they're coming out of India right now. I, I think what you said for oil is, is true up, uh, to a certain extent also for food, upping our production, expanding the use of arable land, releasing strategic reserves and, mm -hmm. and thinking about price caps or, or price management. I think all of those are also part of the, part of the solution here, but we're certainly very worried seeing uh, countries uh, fall back to some kind of protectionist uh, mm -hmm. response in, in, in this area. So you did just say export controls, and that's something that we just use the TTC to, you know, push to the max in the Russia case, right? And, and there are growing debates about how we deploy this on, on China, right? I mean, we've been, I've been part of myriad working groups talking about, you know, how do you apply the foreign direct product rule appropriately? How do we plurilateralize this, right? So if we're using export controls for our security priorities, others are going to do that too, right, for theirs. So that this is sort of, I, I, you know, I, I do not that I, I'm not a personal critic, critic of any of the policy choices that we've made, but again, like, I think this goes back to what, what Charles was saying about perceptions, about, you know, who's, who's, your problems are your problems and others' problems are other problems, right? I mean, I was in um, Mexico a few weeks ago, and this was in the middle of, you know, when we were ramping up sanctions on Russia, and all, we were all getting calls left and right to try to explain what was going on, and I was watching the television, and I didn't hear the word Ukraine once, right? Mexico's a major country, right? So we're, I think what we're, we risk here a little bit is sort of a, um, a re, you know, a reorientation around, you know, the, the, the problems of, uh, individual problems, right? And the, the, and the fact that we, we may be restricting, uh, restricting supply chains as we do at the same time. I don't know. I mean, Charles. Well, so specifically on food, I think um, it's one of the reasons why there's still uh, there are intentional loopholes in the Russian sanctions package yeah. uh, because Russia is also a major food exporter, uh, not to the US or to um, the, the EU very much, but to um, friends, partners in um, developing uh, parts of the world uh, who need Russian wheat. Um, some of that um, trade, some of the money flows through Europe, and that's why there is there are still um, ways you can make transactions with Russia, and I think we all agree that that's justified. Um, so part of it is making sure that Russia remains a reliable supplier. Sounds funny given everything we've been working on and the fact that we all want the sanctions to work, uh, but there are loopholes that need to be there um, because we're pragmatic and Russia will, um, if, it, if we're still able to send money to Russia for its wheat, uh, it will, I think, deliver to um, other parts of the world that need uh, those exports. Uh, Ukraine has also started planting um, heroically, uh, so um, hopefully the food crisis won't be quite as bad as we uh, thought it might be um, six weeks ago, two months ago, um, but uh, because of the price issues, it, it will be quite difficult next year. Um, but that was just my little uh, contribution as a Russia economist. <laughs>
<laughs> can I can I just maybe say what? Because I I, I I don't like that we would conflate the debate on export restrictions for wheat mm -hmm. with export controls for for let's say telecom infrastructure. I mean, in in, in the case of export controls, mm -hmm. we don't want a third country to benefit from our goods. In, in the mm -hmm. case of export restrictions, it's that we want our domestic uh, our, our people and, and citizens to, to benefit from from mm -hmm. that, as is the case in in, in India. So they're they're very different things. And, and to Charles's point, I think we we are. Uh, providing still and allowing for trade in essential goods and pharmaceuticals and, and food are, are the, the two products that are still being traded with, with Russia, uh, both in not just imports from Russia, but also exports uh, to Russia. So, uh, so, so, so we're talking about two, two different issues here, even if the national security argument come, comes in, uh, in in both contexts. So I think the, the, the issue is for export restrictions and food security is that we actually talk to each other mm -hmm. uh, to find a real solution. And what we're saying is that export restrictions are not the solution, because if we would all do this, uh, no one will will benefit from. Uh, we'll all be in in trouble, and and that's the the kind of classical case for uh, for for more classical trade, uh, trade. So openness yeah. and diversification remains uh, remains critical, um, and I think that's part of the response that we will uh, provide to India. Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't be a moderator if I wasn't provoking you a little bit. I'm thinking just about countries' perceptions, right? Um, um, we have uh, five minutes left, and I'm going to turn back to the sort of positive side for final remarks from each of you, which is. Um, how does the transatlantic economy per se benefit from this, right? If we are, if, you know, Russia is to be an uninvestable object, uh, if China is becoming, uh, is still critical to our economies, let's not pretend that's not so, but becoming much more difficult to deal with and in their zero COVID environment looking at uh, a, a retracting economy, you know, what, what, how can we benefit from this ourselves? And maybe I'll go, I'll go backwards, I'll start with Charles. Um, well, I think mechanically, automatically, since um, investment will no longer be flowing to Russia and China is a, a more difficult issue and that's a growing issue really, um, mechanically investments will retract to more familiar territory and you will have much more bilateral investment. It's already trillion strong every year. You have trillions flowing from the EU into the US and trillions flowing from the US into the EU. We are our strongest mutual partners already uh, and I think that there will, as we've been slightly distracted from each other, part of it has been political, part of it has been that there have been growth opportunities elsewhere, but um, it is perhaps a reassuring coincidence that the political conversation is, is happier now, and also that I think investment uh, and the relative weight of US and EU investment will grow faster in the coming years, um, because of, for sad reasons, but at least uh, we have each other, to uh, we can rely on each other. Beth? Um, this sort of gets back to globalization 1.0, I think part of the conversation in the United States for many years was we were going to move to a services economy and we didn't really need to have a manufacturing base. And I think uh, it's pretty clear that we actually do need to have core manufacturing. It doesn't have to be onshoring of everything, but we need that core capacity. We need it to be able to meet our needs, whether it's a natural disaster or whether it's a man-made disaster. So uh, I think it's it, the opportunity to facilitate the reconstruction of our domestic industrial base this is an opportunity, really, I think when we look at the CHIPS Act for us and your efforts on semiconductors, the fact that we are coordinating so we avoid a subsidy race is really important. But I think this is one of the pathways towards moving past globalization 1.0 towards a system that is more uh, sort of stable, sustainable, and resilient. I'll, I'll just sort of build on what, what Charles said. This is mm -hmm. the greatest uh, economic relationship there is in the world, the EU-US relationship. And, it, and it's great not because of people like me, but because we have these connections on a day-to-day -day basis. Trillions are being moved around, researchers, uh, uh, workers, uh, businesses are, 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 we're so strongly connected. And I think that the challenge is that we, 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 keep, we, keep, we, keep, we avoid a distraction. As, as Charles said, we, we don't want to be distracted by uh, issues that are there, that are there for a reason, that are there for a while. There's a lot of old chestnuts in our relationships also. Um, but, uh, but fundamentally, we need to appreciate and protect that this is a, an investment relationship, even more than it is a trade relationship, um, and that we want to keep it strong, uh, and, and that we really make this into a platform and a relationship that helps us to address those global challenges of which there are so many. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure to have all of you, um, Charles, Beth, Thomas, uh, for this this event, a fascinating conversation, um, didn't get to half of the questions that were here, so that speaks to the engagement both from our colleagues in the room but also from, uh, from our virtual audience. Um, and from me um, to all of you, thank you so much for joining. Um, please uh, stay in touch and continue to work with the Geoeconomic Center here at the Atlanta Council, uh, continuing to expand every day, again, on Bretton Woods, on sanctions, on digital currencies. 
And I hope to see you all in Berlin, um, Germany. It's a very lovely city in June. So again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a lovely afternoon.